You just have to kind of stick with me, stay with me. We're going to use quite a few scriptures. Uh, probably Luke 13 would be a good place for you to end up. And, and then uh, we'll just kind of move through quite a bit here. Got a lot going on. Got a lot going on. You see all the scriptures coming up. There's a lot of things we want to walk through. Don't, don't, <laughs> you know, it's going to be hard for you to try. I'm just going to leave you sitting, all right? Because so, you'd be up all the sermon if I had you get up for reading of the Word. What a couple of weeks we've had in January. Member of this house, 19-year-old daughter, was murdered um, at a carjacking. Jack Schultz's daughter, 19, we mentioned that. Yesterday, I did a funeral of a 63-year-old man in our church considered and the uh, New Caney camp is considered the Cajun lumberjack. At one time, he was 360 pounds of pure muscle. And uh, I saw him diminish all the way down into a wheelchair. And at 63, he passed. I did his funeral yesterday. Uh, Sunday, last Sunday, I embraced a lady. Let me just tell you, I just reached out like I normally do and shake hands. If they want to hug, I hug them. But she didn't hug me. She embraced me. And I knew at that moment... There's a lot of stuff going on in her life. She said, Pastor, today was so good. I'm so encouraged by the word, and it's just good to be here. I could see the joy on her face. 1.30 that night, uh, an ex-boyfriend had broken her home, beat her with a baseball bat, tried to take her life with a knife, and then shot her. And uh, then he took his own life, a man that I know. And so... This, she went through emergency surgery. I'm letting you know this because it kind of builds into why I'm preaching what I'm preaching. There's evil in this world. You know, and not everything is God sent, but it can be God used. And as she was, uh, we didn't know if she would make it. Uh, she was shot in the back. He, he aimed for her head. And her daughter jumped on his back and, and made the bullet go elsewhere. And uh, so last night before, before I went to bed, I noticed I had a, a call on my phone, and uh, she's been in a kind of a, a, a private place, matter of fact, under a, an alias name where nobody could get in to see her because it's under criminal investigation. And I tried to get in to see her. They, they acted like she wasn't there, and so I get this message last night, and it was from Denise, and she said, Pastor, I want you to know I thank God for the prayers of this church, the people here, uh, you trying to visit uh, she didn't talk much about the trauma of it, but she said, I'm, I'm walking, I'm talking. I got surgery this morning to repair parts of my neck and the infection. Uh, but she said, I'm alive, and I'm thankful to be alive. And I thought to myself, that is prayer. Amen. I mean, all the th I thank God for the medical and all that. But, but any little move with the bat, the knife, or the gun would have took her life. And yet, she's still alive to give God praise. Amen? Can we give God a little praise in this house for that? I mentioned to you Tuesday night that, that fasting often brings this thing in your life where uh, you, you're a little more emotional. Because when you do without food, when you do without certain drinks, when you do without uh, certain entertainments, now you start to realize what a lot of the world is going through. And uh, if, as long as you are stuffing stuff into you and taking care of you all the time, you don't realize the hurt that other people are going through. And as soon as this happened last week, I found myself in tears. And it's just like I, they flowed so easy. I didn't have to make them happen. They were just flowing. I was hurting for her. I was hurting for the body of Christ. I've had this happen in my own family. I have uh, uh, vivid memories of it. And the scripture says in the book of Job, chapter 14, verse 1, man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. You want to know something. All you got to do is enter the human race and find out how quick trouble's coming. There's two scriptures I know of that talks about when trouble comes. First, to be born in the human race is trouble. The second one is to get married. Just want to throw it out there for you, okay? You deal with it the best you can. But if you know anything about it, uh, well, I'll leave that one. That's for Valentine's Day. Uh, but throughout Scripture, great men and women of God have been brought to their knees with grief. They have shed tears. The Scripture teaches us we're created in the image of God. By the image of God, I believe that God will have hands and feet. And, and have uh, the Bible says that His eyes roam to and fro. His ears hear our prayer. His mouth speaks to us. But Jesus put a dimension on God that we had never seen. 
Jesus came to show us the Father. The Old Testament did not understand it. They thought he was belligerent, mean, uh, 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 one that would take you out because of uh, whenever there was sin in the camp, oftentimes God would open up the ground, swallow them, send snakes to bite them. You know, uh, there would be poison, all kinds of stuff. So they had this image of God on the mountain shaking and, and the, the, the fire hitting and with the smoke and the voice. And they said, Moses talked for us. We talked about that last week. But now Jesus comes and said, no, I think you missed it. You missed it a little bit more about him. Nehemiah chapter 1 says, when Nehemiah learned of the deplorable condition of Jerusalem, one of the remnant, this young, this man who was a cupbearer, amen, he returned back there and he sat down and he wept and he mourned for days over the destruction of the city, the walls falling in Jerusalem. And of course, you know, he was the repairer of the walls and the breach and, and encouraged people to do that through the generosity of Anaxerxes. Genesis 23, 2 says, when Sarah died, Abraham mourned and wept for her. Genesis 37, 35, when Jacob was presented with a horrifying evidence that his beloved son Joseph had been slain by a wild beast. You remember his brothers threw him in a pit, sold him off into slavery, took his coat of many colors and dipped it in blood and brought it home and told dad, uh, you know, Joseph was killed by an animal. You know, and so, so the scripture says that when Jacob heard that, he began to weep for him and to cry over his son, which actually was not true. He refused to be comforted. Joseph wept in Genesis 50, verse 1. The young boy, after he was reconnected back with his dad as he was leading Egypt's uh, industry, if you would, the economy there, Joseph wept for his father Jacob when he died. Isaiah 24, Isaiah wept bitterly over the impending destruction of his people, as did the weeping prophet Jeremiah. All through the, the study of Jeremiah, you'll find out Jeremiah never had a convert. I can't, I can't go a Sunday without knowing somebody gave their life to Jesus. I stood yesterday at that funeral knowing that, that uh, Monty Darbone had been in our church over and over and over again and, and had given his life to Christ and had come out of so much stuff but did everything he could to lean and to press into the things of God. You knew Monty, didn't you? Uh, sis, do you know him? Uh, no, no, not you. Do you know him? Yeah, big guy. Hung out with Mike Pruitt. Yeah, well, there's some bars that you may have been in years ago that I talked to some people about, and they told me that they had been in bars, and then they mentioned Mike's name, and I thought, okay, that Don is connected. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'm sorry to bring that up. Everybody connected somehow, amen? Oh, right. yeah. But just knowing that, that Monty, yeah, I stood there with tremendous confidence, knowing that I believed I'd see Monty again, and he'd be in good health. Hallelujah, I just, I just got to believe that. Uh, Matthew 26, 75, Peter went out, and he wept bitterly after denying the Lord. Matthew 8, 12, on the day of judgment, there the Bible says one thing is going to be for sure. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That people will be crying. And, and I know many times we think the weeping is over the fact that, that we're in trouble, the fact that, that we're in pain. But I actually believe that it's going to be a little bit more of regret. It's going to be one of those what I wished I'd have done, that I could have done more, that I had opportunity to accept Christ and, and serve him all of my life, and I didn't do it. And there was gnashing, which speaks of pain, hurt uh, to the bone if you would. So none of us are strangers to tears. None of us are immune from seasons of grief. They're part of life. They're evident of our humanity. Thus, it is quite significant to note the tears of Jesus. This morning, I want to talk to you about when God cried. And you've seen me lace up the fact that there is a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but all three are integrated together. It's hard to pull one apart. It's, it's hard to separate the, the egg from the yolk from the, uh, uh, the white. It's just it's all connected, if you would. And so when I see what Jesus did, it tells me what the Father did. Isaiah 53, 3 says, Like us, Jesus was a man acquainted with grief. He was despised forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Although Jesus wept very rarely in the Bible, you'll see it. There are some examples of the tears of Christ that help us to know more about Jesus. Several scriptures in the gospel record Jesus weeping. Two showed his heartfelt love for groups. Just great big groups. I can be among bikers and I can feel the tears come up as I realize that these men and women need Jesus. I can be around cowboys and feel that way. I can be among folk and realize these folk need God. But on the flip side, there was one time that he wept for an individual. First, let's talk about his love for the masses. Luke 13, 34, Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, look at over that city. You who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. 
Look, your house is left to you desolate. You know, Jesus would. They would not. All through our lives, I want to tell you, Jesus would. He was after you long before he got you. I know many of you thought, well, you know, I came to Jesus. Ah, it was a setup. I promise you. Amen. God did things to hem you in, to push you into a moment where you had that opportunity to say yes or no. He would. Many of us wouldn't. But then there's that time when we finally gave in. But he wept over the city. He cried over the city. It began to hit him. And Jesus was a man who didn't fast just in January. Amen. He lived a fasted life. He lived a life of prayer. He lived a life of giving himself to others. Luke 19 tells us that when he approached there, he prayed. He asked God, to, I wish I could have pulled them in together. Amen. If you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. I ask people, particularly as they get older, what is the one thing you want in life? You know what it will be? It will be peace. I just want peace. When there's conflict in a marriage, people want peace. When there's conflict in a business, people want peace. I just want peace. I just want to adjust my life to the will of God so things start lining up. And even if there's a storm around me, I'm still in good in life. I feel good right now. Amen. I feel peace around me. That's the powerful thing that we want. And he said, if you would have let me gather you up, if you would have come to me, if you would have let me put my arms around you, it would have brought you peace. I see this over and over. People's lives are in turmoil. And next thing you know, they connect with Christ. And, you know, uh, Jack told me last week. I, I know this young man, Jack, whose daughter was murdered in that, that car jack. And I can tell you what he wanted to do. Like many of you daddies, he wanted to take vengeance very quickly. He wanted to deal with it. And we talked about it. But there was a peace that came over him. And he knew somehow, some way, God was going to take care of this situation. And, and, if, and if, if there's a chance later, I'm, I'm not even going to go there in my mind. But I just believe that, that Jack's going to. Things are going to be okay there. But there was a peace that came over him because of his love for God, that he had been embraced. How do you go through tragedy without God? How do you handle a, a crippling disease without God? How do you handle the loss of a loved one without God? How can you handle And that's what Jesus was saying. Jerusalem, he knew, he knew, and he said it. He said it on his way to the cross when he looked at the women crying and over him, going to the cross. You remember the mourners? He said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. Amen. Knowing that, that Titus was going to come in, the son, the, the son of Vespasian, and surround the city of Jerusalem. And the mothers would end up having to devour their own children to survive. He said, don't weep for me. If you would have embraced me, you would have found peace. If you had embraced me, that's Matthew 24, by the way, if you want to study that out some. Amen. These instances where Jesus wept revealed to us uh, this deeply heart that he had moved by the plight of people who chose to reject him both while in route to jerusalem and then overlooking the city of jerusalem and its thousands of residents jesus heart was deeply saddened by the failure of the majority to receive him when i read these scriptures oh jerusalem jerusalem he repeats it twice very seldom does he repeat one word twice in scripture but it moved him how often i've longed to gather you i've wanted you i came for this reason you were you were not willing so I have to leave you desolate. There are times as parents, our kids ain't willing. But we got to leave them a little desolate. Amen. We got to leave them in a situation where, you know, you got to have to figure this thing out for yourself. He wept over it. Amen. On this occasion. He had only known what would bring you peace. You would have embraced me. He was weeping over the tragedy of a lost opportunity. The Israelites that assembled in Jerusalem for the Passover missed the opportunity to be saved from both earthly and eternal destruction. They were visited by their Savior, but they did not know it. Instead of receiving him, they killed him. And I want you to think, 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 take this in. He came to rescue them. He came to give them peace. He came to bless them. And yet, they, they crucified him. And he saw it coming. He wept because he was not willing that any should perish. And we say that scripture, that God is not willing that any should perish, but we don't take it in. And for this month and, and over the next few months and over my whole life, I've got to get this back inside of me that everybody I meet are either going to spend heaven in peace with God or are they going to spend eternity in a devil's hell where there's weeping and gnashing? I would love to pull away from that as I see churches over and over again that are falling into inclusion and saying, all you've got to do is love. Love the Buddhists, love the Muslims, love the Christians. You know, God is he's universal over all of it. You don't have to call on Jesus. You can worship whatever you want, and we're all going to get to heaven. Jesus didn't say that. 
Amen. He, he came. He died for us. No other, no one else ever did that for me. Amen. Nobody loved me like that. And the Bible lines up. 66 books line up from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. And pushes through this thought that he's the way, the truth, and the life. He was weeping over this tragedy. 1 Timothy 2, 3. Paul speaking to Timothy says, This is a good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. And it come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. Not any, again, not to beat a dead horse here because you can't get him back alive. Not a Buddha. Not a Muhammad. Not, not a Mary. There's nothing between God and man except Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Second Peter chapter 3, Peter with the revelation, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. Everybody say long-suffering. Who long don't you love long-suffering? Now, I like that word long-suffering. That means that he's suffering long with us. It doesn't mean that I'm getting, I'm suffering. It means that he's, if you're a parent, and you got any kind of mercy in your heart, you understand long-suffering. That's when you smile at the stupidity of your children. Looking back at life, remembering your mom and daddy, smiling at the stupidity of your raising. Amen. And, and, and you would hear them words, if, if, I, if I got to get up, if I get to three, I can't stand a parent telling a kid, on three. And that kid testing them all the way up to three. By two and a half, the belt needs to be off. By three, it needs to be swinging. Man, when I was a kid, there's certain things you did not do. My dad was long-suffering, as a rule, when he was sober. <laughs> he was long-suffering. He would, he, he, he would deal with us, me and my brother, always in trouble. And, and when one got in trouble, the other got in trouble, and it's vice versa. If Jimmy did it, I got whooped. If I did it, he got whooped. It didn't matter. It's just the way it was. And so, because dad just figured if one of you did it, the other one was in on it. Okay. Because we didn't, we, we didn't have the availability to, to internet and to talk and to text and all that other stuff. We were together all the time, one year apart. And uh, I remember being in the back of a pickup truck, old 49 Ford. And uh, I got up. My, my, we were, I don't know where we were hauling trash. In those days, you could ride in the back of a truck. In those days, you could ride in the window in the back of the car. In those days, they'd just throw you anywhere in the car. You were just luggage. And so I'm in the back of the truck, and I remember my cousin and them encouraging me to, to walk to the, to the tailgate and come back to the front. We were sitting with our backs to the cab. And I'll never forget this. I, I, I walked over there, and I, I touched the tailgate because they, they dared me. He meant I'd take a dare. And I turned around, and I started to walk those few steps back to the back in that truck, and I saw my daddy's eyes. Right there. And I just melted <laughs> straight down. And we got home. There were times that my dad was not like Jesus <laughs> at all. The long suffering, the putting up with, my shenanigans, and all the little things I did had finally hit a boiling point. And he took me out. He didn't count to three, he didn't say a word. He grabbed my hand, grabbed that belt. And he took me so far out behind the house. Any guys have been with me, I can show you where it's at. Out to past the two-holer bathroom and out to the musky down vines. That was far enough away that my mama couldn't hear me. And it, cause my mama was the mercy. I always say M-O-M stands for a, 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 a minister of mercy. That's mama. Dad, I probably got another acronym for D-A-D. -D. I can tell you all about that after church. But my dad took me out there. And I, I, I mean, he wore me out. I, I won't even get the back of a truck now. I just tell everybody, y'all hop back there and get that for me. You watch it right there, David? I said, y'all get back in. Remember, y'all get back in. Get I, I just have these flashbacks of a good beating. Amen. Uh, my dad, he missed up being like Jesus. But here the scripture says, but it's long suffering to us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Aren't you appreciative of the long suffering of God? Amen. That you know what you've done. You know the rebellion, the stubbornness, the hardness of your heart. And yet God says, you know what? I'm going to give you, I'm going to help you out a little bit more. I'm going to be a little long suffering. I'm going to be the one suffering while you're doing what you're doing. But I want you to understand. And here's the thing. Once you understand it hurts the father, you give in quicker. Because I don't want you suffering no more. I don't want you hurting no more. Amen. I don't want you dealing with that no more. 
Amen. Long suffering. One more quick story could just come to my mind. Uh, my, my son who works with us, uh, Josiah was, a, he was, he was trouble when he was young. And uh, always getting, just mischievous, just mischievous, always doing stuff. And, and I'm a very long suffering dad. Loved that boy. And I, I, I whooped him for riding his bicycle out on Highway 90. Some of you might remember that story. When I told him, you're going to die if you go out on that highway. And Kenny, he crossed the freeway on his bike, came back. He wasn't three years old. And he yelled at me and he said, I ain't dead. <laughs> yeah, I come off that lawnmower. I wore him out. Top of a tree, wore him out. Sticking nails in a, in, in a, a 110 socket, I wore him out. Finally, I got tired of beating the boy. I just got tired of it. I mean, I've been suffering with this boy over and over. And he was uh, probably, before he was a teenager, I, I took, uh, took the belt, and he knew I was fixing to whoop him. And I took my leg up like that, and I handed him the belt. And I said, I, I'm tired of whooping you, son. Whoop me. And he started crying. And I said, no, you're going to take that belt, and you're going to hit me across my leg as hard as you can because I'm tired of whooping you. And he'd hit me, and I'd say harder. And he would begin to convulse and cry as he hit me on the leg with that belt. Under helping him to understand that I ain't here to hurt you, but what you're doing is hurting me. Now, as he got older, I quit doing that. <laughs> I personally, and if you're a parent, you'll try anything. Amen? You, you have to. I personally feel a sense of conviction when reading these verses, though, at times I've been moved to tears as I look around from funerals to weddings, sporting events, and I see people rejecting Jesus. You have to ask yourself, why aren't we brought to tears anymore? Why aren't we weeping anymore? Why, why don't we feel what God is feeling for the masses and for the people out there? The Savior was. He, we see Jesus crying as he pondered the pending condemnation of those who chose to resist his gracious words. Jesus was moved to tears by the faithlessness and hardness of heart of the majority of the population of this entire city that will eventually crucify him. And you got to think about that. Allow the Holy Spirit to place into you a heart, a burden for the lost souls of our city. The city of Crosby and Huffman and Channelview and Humble and Tascacita, Dayton, Baytown, New Caney, Porter, Cleveland, Splendora, Conroe. I'm not responsible for San Antonio, but I'm responsible for East Texas. Amen. Where I'm at. And when God put you into a place, he put you here for a reason. Until you start carrying that burden on you. And I, I know, guys, listen, this is kind of, it, this will condemn you if you're not careful, but I wanted to convict you. Do not get to heaven knowing that you've never won anybody to Jesus. Make it your life's goal. That eventually I want to win somebody to Christ. I want to pray with them to receive Jesus. I want to know that I know that when they leave this place that they know Jesus. And I'll do whatever. And it, listen, your, your place is just to keep watering it, keep sowing the seed. But God will bring the increase. Amen. So don't be, you know, well, I didn't get to pray with them, Pastor. Well, that's okay. But if you watered it, you throw the seed, then sometimes that's as good as what. There's certain family members, all I can do is throw water on them. Amen. His love for the individual. John eleven thirty two. 32, you know his love for Mary and Martha. Two of his favorites. Oh, he loved Mary and Martha. I think there was peace at Mary and Martha's house. I think it was a refuge. It was that place he could go and have a safe place. He would escape to Mary and Martha's place often. They had a brother there named Lazarus. Oh, man, he had a, he had a fondness for Lazarus. And Lazarus died. The Bible doesn't tell us how he died, why he died. They just said that he died. And as he, as he died, they wrapped him, uh, his hands to his body, his feet, all the way up. They put him in a tomb. They put, uh, put him there, put the stone in front. And then they sent word to Jesus. They told Jesus first he was sick. And just like when John the Baptist was in prison, Jesus didn't show up. He didn't show up the first day. You know that, that Mary and Martha were looking out the window. Second day, he didn't show up. By the third day, they ringing his phone off the hook. Because he ain't there. Where is he at? By the time he shows up, Lazarus is already dead. When the scripture says in John eleven thirty two, 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She believed in him. She had a, a confidence in him that if he said anything, it was going to happen. They knew of the miracles of Christ. If you would have been here, this thing would have been a little bit different. Be careful about the... Uh, 
somebody putting something on you had you been there. You know what I'm saying? Many times folks say, well, if you'd have picked up the phone, if you'd have done this, this wouldn't have happened. If Trump hadn't have bombed Iran, Iran wouldn't have shot down a plane. Right? You know, you hear that. This, this. So she said, hey, Jesus, had you been here, he wouldn't have died. Then Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews had come along with her also weeping. You know about the professional weepers. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. When you observe this chaotic scene in the wailing and the people acting up, he was so moved. The Bible said moved and troubled. The word deeply moved is a misleading translation of the verb here, which literally means to snort like a horse. I mean, he was angry. I know some of you, you know, when you get to laughing or something happens, you snort and it's like, didn't mean for that to happen on the date. <laughs> well, at this moment, Jesus has this, he, he's like that bull. He's snorting about this, this, this pain that he's feeling and the feeling of Mary and Martha. It includes the connotation of anger and outrage and indignation. Jesus appears to have been angry, not only over the painful reality of sin and death, of which Lazarus was an example, but perhaps also the mourners who were acting like the pagans who had no hope, just wailing and wailing. Many of you know that a lot of the mourners got paid for mourning like that. He was troubled, further emphasized the intensity of the Lord's reaction. The term is similarly used elsewhere to describe strong emotions. Emotions, such as the disciples' terror when they saw Jesus walking on the water. The disciples' amazement at seeing Jesus after his resurrection. Jesus' reaction to his impending death and his response to Judas' imminent betrayal. Jesus said after this, when he was troubled, where have you laid him? Where did you put him? And he, asked, they, he said, uh, they said, come and see, Lord. They replied, and Jesus wept. Yeah, I know. Shortest verse in the Bible. John 6, 35. Jesus wept. What happened at that moment had to be, I hope they gave him a chance just to cry. I hope they didn't rush and grab his hand and pull him. I hope they allowed him just to weep, just to show us what God looks. So when I read that scripture, it tells me that my God's man enough to cry, that my God can stand over a crowd. He doesn't have to puff up or get mad. He weeps over the hurting of people. And what they've gone through in life. And as a pastor and you as a minister of the gospel, which all of you are, you've got to realize the heart of God weeps over this generation. Amen. There's such pain that goes through. And he began to cry. He began to weep. The word there, a, rare used, a, a rarely used word in the New Testament, in contrast to the loud wailing, has the connotation of silently bursting into tears. Unlike the typical funeral mourners, Jesus' tears were generated both by his love for Lazarus and by his grief over the deadly effects of sin in a fallen world. Verse 35, though it is the shortest verse in Scripture, it's so rich with meaning. It's God wept. He cried. It emphasizes his humanity. He was truly a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. But while the Jews were co correct in seeing Jesus' sorrows evident that he loved Lazarus, they were wrong to think that his tears rejected the same hopeless despair that they felt. They cried because they felt no hope. Jesus was crying because he loved Lazarus, Mary, Martha. We saw the fall of the world. But he knows. And this is what I hear. When I'm at a funeral and I see people weeping, I'm thinking, if you knew your loved one knows God, let those tears flow. Man, go ahead and cry. It's okay. But we go going to see them again. Amen. We're going to connect with it one more time. Take away the stone, Jesus called in a loud voice. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off, his, off the grave clothes and let him, grow, let him go. The plight of that individual, and then again, my mind sees this man like worming his way out. Uh, of the tomb. He said, what would you think? I had it made. I was in the heavens with the Father. Things were rocking. I was enjoying fellowship. And all of a sudden, a voice pierced the stratosphere. Lazarus! Huh? Get back down here! Come on, your sister's crying, your other sister's crying, this outfit down here is wailing. Get back down here. Now, he didn't say all that. All he said was, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, the Bible says, be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. So he was with the Lord. So he had to back down to earth, back into the body. Oh, man. 
Can you imagine being unrestricted in every way? To go back in the restrictions of this, the restraints of this, the fatigue of this, the tiredness of this. Oh my, amen. And then he comes out, and then he said, unwrap him. You remember what, what the girl said? He stinks. Now I got to deal with the embarrassment of the stink because you're saving up all the good stuff for Jesus when he dies. Remember that? Amen. So I, now I'm smelling. They unwrap me. I got this embarrassing moment. And he pops out. And then when he gets done, he smiles. He says, hey, guys, everything's good. If you read the rest, if you keep on reading, you'll find out the next time you find Lazarus, he's reclining with Jesus. He just hung out with Jesus. Can you imagine the conversations I had? Jesus, uh, Lazarus looks over at Jesus and says, hey, man, dude, that place where I just was, Gold Street, Pearl Gates. Oh, amazing worship. Your dad is so cool. He creates things just by talking. And by, while they're chatting with one another, Mary comes in to sit down by Jesus' feet, and Jesus looks over at Lazarus and goes, Shh, don't talk about it. Don't say nothing about where you've been. Gotcha. Come on, Josiah. Could you ever let your imagination run a little bit when you're reading the Bible? You know Lazarus had to talk about it. You know he had to talk about it. Amen. He cried over this. Lazarus was dead and Jesus was moved. Amen. The onlookers noted his sorrow, commented, see how he loved it. I believe Jesus, my friend, is troubled and moved by our needs. I think there are times he sees what you're going through and he, there's a troubling inside of him. I'm not saying there's still tears up in heaven. I, I don't know that. But I do believe this. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That when we're hurting, that he feels that hurt. He knows that. And that's why we got to call on him. That's why we got to pray. There are three things that I, I said last week that believers don't like doing. You want to know what they are? Actually, there's four. First, that we don't like praying. We don't like fasting. And we don't like giving. The fourth one is we don't like exercise. Now, that ain't in the Bible. I just threw that out there since I already started. We don't like, we don't like praying. Because prayer says we got to stop for a few minutes. we got to talk to God about a situation. Then our minds drift. Our phone goes off. This happens. That happens. The kid grabs us. And all of a sudden, we, and we struggle with praying. The issue is the more I pray, the more I take everything I get from God immediately to prayer like he did. Jesus slipped through the crowd, went out in the wilderness and prayed over and over. When I do that, eventually I get into a place where the first thing I do is not a text, it's not a call, it's not a hospital, it's I talk to God about it. And when I talk to God about it, there's this delight in my life when I know that God answers my prayer. Don't tell me that Monday morning when my phone went off that I thought that a woman that had been beaten, stabbed, and shot was going to live. All I had to do was call out to you guys and say, let's pray for her that God will do something miraculous here. And now I get a phone call six days later saying she lives and she's alive. So prayer becomes then a delight because you start getting an answer. Then you start fasting. You start fasting. You don't like to fast. You don't like to say no to a cheeseburger. You don't like to say no to certain foods. You like your stuff smothered and covered and, 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 and diced and, and baked and fried. Oh, I love fried food. We love it. And then we say to ourselves, no, I'm going to let that go. I'm, 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 this time, I, I've got no more alcohol for, for 21 days, no more uh, nicotine, no more caffeine. We'll give this up for a little bit. This is what I've decided to do. No, no, no more uh, uh, certain drinks. I, I'm going to let uh, no more entertainment. Let, and your body goes, are you serious? Are you serious? Your kids are eating whatever they want. So-and-so's watching whatever he wants. They're doing whatever they want. And you're going to give up 21 days of your life fasting? Don't you know that's so Old Testament? And then you realize Jesus did it. The disciples practiced it. That this is something that was, that if you get sick, your body's going to shut down. And watch, you start fasting and you make it a day. And maybe you decide, I'm going to eat one meal a day. You made it. Then you say, you know what, I think I'll give up, a, a, I'll make it a whole day. Uh, I forgot to tell you, did you know you can eat after 5 o'clock? You can go from 5 o'clock to 5 o'clock the next day. That's 24 hours if you want to sleep through some of your fasting. Huh? You hear me? 
Just giving you a little lupo. But you hit a place where all of a sudden your, your head quits hurting and your body's detoxed and, and your hair looking better, your skin is clearing up, the psoriasis are drying up, the diabetes, you don't have to have as many shots or pills. All of a sudden your health starts kicking around, you find a sensitivity toward people and because now you're praying, as soon as you hear, you want to pray again real quickly. And you'll say, I believe God can take care of that. It's like you're on a spiritual steroid now. It's like, this is good. Your joints are moving better because they don't have all that grease stuck in them. All these things are better. And life is good. So you, what you hated now is starting to bring benefits into your life. And you start enjoying it. And you start living a fasted life. Oh, and then giving. Oh, I hate when the preacher talks about giving. The biggest fights I've ever had in church with people who never invite me to their fight is on giving. Because anytime I mention giving, they want to fight, but they won't talk to me about it. They go somewhere else and eat, spend, uh, you know, $1,500 on a meal after they drop five bucks in a plate and talked about me talking about giving. Oh, y'all quiet. <laughs> so every year I, I sign all these papers showing what people give. Average household in this church gives about $850 a year. And I go through that and I say, God, I, I'm not going to beat your people up over this. We made it another year. But what would happen if you really, really believed in giving? What if you really believed that if I would let go, that eventually I would become cheerful? Yeah. And my life would tip over to the other side. And that every time I get opportunity to be a giver into somebody's life, I just do it because I can. But first, I hurt doing it. But now, it's like, and when you're fasting, watch how all this works. When you're fasting, normally we go out and eat. We didn't go out to eat one time last week. Mm -hmm. So I had all that Burger King money saved up. <laughs> huh? And be able to release that into somebody else's life. Yeah. Now, these three things that have been a detriment in my life, fasting, Praying and giving have become blessings. Right. And then you start feeling better, so you start exercising. Before you couldn't exercise. But now you're praying, you're fasting, and you're giving, and you start exercising. You don't have to be a lot. I have minimal requirements for myself. But it's something. As long as I do something, start somewhere and see what happens. Jesus looked at the masses and he cried. I would have given you peace. I would have blessed this nation with peace. Can I tell you? Jerusalem has not been at peace for thousands of years. The Middle East has not been in peace for thousands of years. All they had to do was embrace him. Don't ever feel like you are imposing upon Jesus when you come to him with your needs. He's touched by your weakness. He loves you deeply as an individual, not just as part of a, of a larger group. He's moved to tears for us as individuals. He's sad by the plight of man. He meant just as it was for Lazarus. A decision on the earth will secure one's own salvation. And also a decision in the believer's heart will lead to the salvation of others. If I pray, if I fast, if I give, if I stay at this, if I stay at it, if we surrender to do the Father's will, a harvest of lost souls can be won to Christ. Amen. Who, who would not otherwise have been saved because we were moved to tears for them, because we loved him? Hear what Jesus said to his disciples after personally leading a woman at the well to salvation. You heard me talk a couple weeks ago about the woman at the well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus said to John 4, then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up. I say, wake up. Look around. The fields are already ripe for the harvest. Stand with me. Oh, they ripe. When it says they're ripe, let me tell you what that means. That means somebody plowed the furrow. That means somebody planted the seed. That means somebody watered it. 
And he said, at that moment, all you got to do is ask him. I have very seldom been turned down. Very seldom. Well, somebody look at me and say, no, I'd rather go to hell. Very seldom. But most, and here's the thing. It's not just getting them to confess. It's getting them to live out a life in a relationship with Jesus. But just like exercise, you got to start somewhere. Just like prayer, you got to start somewhere. Amen. It may be just thanking God for the food. It may be praying in bed at night. But eventually it works into something. All of us, the scripture says, has to work out our own salvation. I can't work it out for you. You got to decide. Am I going to pray? Am I going to fast? Am I going to give? Am I going to cry? I was raised with a dad who thought tears, at least in the beginning of my life, were for sissies. You didn't cry. You, you pucker up, buttercup. He never called me buttercup. That would have been sweet. But as my dad got older, tears became more frequent. When he hugged his first grandchild, tears became frequent. I mean, just... And those, those grandkids could, I hated the, my kids for the fact that they could get my daddy to do anything. <laughs> they could do that. What grandkids can do. Oh, they loved them grandkids. My dad's tears came easy. And when I realized it was okay for my dad to cry, it was okay for me to cry. It was okay. It's not a bad thing. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Very quickly, if you don't know Christ, not to rush this, but if you don't know him, just put your hand up and back down. Let me pray for you where you're at. Thank you, ma'am. Amen. Anyone else? Thank you. Just put your hand up and back down. That's all you got to do. Don't leave this place the way you came in. If you're not sure about your salvation, make sure today. Anyone else before we pray? Together would we pray this, those hands that were lifted. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. This is my day to serve you the rest of my life. Wash away my past. Walk into my future. Set my steps. I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Listen. God has to give us a heart for the lost. It has to become the cry of our church. Those individuals lifted your hand. God love you today. Amen. For accepting Christ. Now build that relationship with Him. Get in the Word of God. You need help. Please get hold of somebody in this house. Talk to people. Reach toward me. But if you've not led somebody to Christ, that has to become a passion. Don't become robotic. Just begin to ask God. Lord, give me a heart for the lost. Could you say that with me? Give me a heart for the lost. One more time. Give me a heart for the lost. One more time. Give me a heart for the lost. Let your heart start beating. You don't have to become fanatical or radical or, or, or something that drives people away. You keep water in the seeds that have been sown. But then ask God at the right time. Lord, give me that heart that I'll be able to connect with people. Whether it be in a deer stand, horseback, a hot rod event four-wheel drive, got a ladies meeting, skeet shoot. Give me a heart for the lost in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, give God a praise.